um, Carlos Mencia decided to go on the Valuetainment um, channel and sort of explain himself. If you're not familiar with Carlos Mencia, he was f- made famous actually, even before he's, you know, he's got a really, before this whole kicked off, he had pretty good, he was pretty well regarded in the industry. He was sort of like the main person people were looking at in the comedy or stand up world. And then it was kind of, um, then news got out that he was stealing jokes from fellow comedians, which is a big faux pas in the stand-up comedy world. You should never steal jokes. Then he did that thing that people get annoyed about a lot in the comedy world where he's bumping people, which meant if you were meant to go up at, let's say, if you were meant to go up at like nine, which is maybe a prime spot, let's say like eight, and he came in early or he came in later, he'd he essentially have seniority over you and he could essentially jump in front of you. And then what usually happens if he jumps in front of you and he's a well-known act, he would usually do a lot longer of a set than you would do as a kind of up-and-coming person, which would then lead you to have to come on later, um, which might mean the crowd might thin out, people might leave after the main guy has performed, which is it's just not really looked at as a good thing. So he'd do that a lot, a lot of stealing jokes, a lot of bumping. And then eventually he did it to the wrong group of people. He ended up doing it to one of Joe, to some of Joe Rogan's friends. If you know anything about Joe Rogan, he's sort of like the matriarch of the LA comedy scene. He got involved and he famously kind of ripped Cosman C a new one on stage and kind of exposed him to everybody out there. And, and that essentially ruined his reputation. Not not in inter- not in not post it because I think um, in the moment the comedy store and the industry sort of took the side of Joe Joe Rogan and he kind of got thrown out of the comedy store. But then as the years progressed, um, people started to see through the lies and then essentially um, Carlos Messier got cancelled before the cancelling was even a thing. And he's sort of been in um, uh, comedy isolation since then, right? No one's kind of touched him with a barge pole. And I think unlike other industries, comedy is really good that way in that usually, if even if somebody, I think I've kind of, I've described it this way, I think, if you've seen somebody online, if you've seen a comedian online that you don't necessarily like, but you see them hanging around all the comedians that you do like, it's really a good indicator of that person's character outside of what you see on the screen, usually. Because for the most part, I've seen if somebody's a bit of a shithead and people don't like them, they just don't hang around the people that you like. They just aren't around there anymore. Um, they do value a lot of... They do put in... They, they put on a high pedestal, maybe similar to skateboarding that way, where... Um, people care more about what people in the industry people their their peers think about them as opposed to just random strangers um so that kind of allows them to kind of police themselves so uh that was basically what happened and since then you know he's obviously still working as a comedian he's not working a normal office job so that is still a good thing but in terms of being welcomed by his community by his peers no one really wants to touch him so um credit to value Tainment for sitting him down and having an interview with him and sort of allowing him to kind of explain himself but as you see with this clip i'm going to play he doesn't necessarily apologize he sort of kind of half kind of says you know, I tried my best to apologize. No, he, he basically, how he explains it is that he has nothing to apologize for because he doesn't think he did the things that people are angry about him for. And I guess when you want to, when you want to, when you want to apologize or you want to kind of rectify things, one thing that you quickly realize is that it's very unlikely that two people are going to agree on every, you're going to agree on every point of contrition. You're not going to do that. There has to be a time where you sort of like agree to disagree, but for the sake of, um, for the sake of uh, kinship, for the sake of maintaining the peace, you just kind of, you know, okay, cool. I submit. I apologize for that. I don't mean to, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but you don't say, oh, if you were offended, I'm sorry. You just apologize outright so you can move on and, um, you know, continue your friendship. But he didn't want to do that. So this is a clip from Value Tamer that sort of uh, lays it bare a bit so you can hear or see what I'm talking about. My dad told me this a long time ago when we came here. So let me tell you how America's built. He said America likes new heroes. I agree. But when they get new heroes, America loves to see that new hero fall. Right. But what America loves even more is to see that fallen hero redeem himself and come back up. Completely agree. I think you have a big opportunity to do that, man. I, 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 I agree, but here's the problem. You want me to, or people want me to accept something that I I didn't do in the way that they say that I did. I don't know. I... Which is the issue. So in his head, he just doesn't think he stole any jokes the way they think he did it. So he probably is kind of describing himself. Maybe he's kind of his excuses that is parallel thinking. I don't know. But I'll just think with all these years that have gone by, I think it's maybe 15 years since that incident happened. 
there has to come a point there has to come there has to come to a point where if everyone agrees with the narrative that you are a joke thief then you just have to you know confess and just say look even though i don't agree with what you're saying just for the sake of just can you know so i can go back we can welcome back into the community scene i'm gonna say sorry but he just doesn't want to say it which is bizarre really because i think you know again looking from the outside in it looks like if you're not friends with other stand-ups you're essentially just you know what, what are you then are you really a stand-up comedian if you can't go on people's podcasts if you can't hang out if you can't exchange jokes on social media it doesn't necessarily seem as fun in it part of the reason why you're doing this is to kind of be a um to kind of be an adult kid and what's the point of just doing it as just a job when you don't have the kind of camaraderie with your fellow peers that doesn't make any sense but i don't know and i'm smart enough to know that i i could apologize and move on and whatever but like i said i've i've called these guys personally i've asked them about it 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 doesn't come up other than in moments like this I, I don't know what to say to you. Which I don't think is true. He said it doesn't come up in moments like this, but I'm pretty sure these guys, if there's anything I know about listening to comedians on podcasts, is that they're a chatty bunch. They love a good gossip. So he might not think it comes up in conversations because he's not there, but it definitely does come up. Maybe one day you you should ask, you know, Joe, if you have him on, why, why he did it, what his impetus was. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe one the last day, time you reached out to him? Okay, so from my perspective, yeah. here's a guy who, who purposely tried to ruin my career and in many ways succeeded. I've never done anything to him. Which is a weird sort of way of explaining the situation because it takes out all the context and all the nuance that led to it. In his head, he doesn't think he has any reason to call Joe Rogan, even though he says he ascribes the fact that his guy ruined his career. But if you look at it, he ruined your own career. If you allow these, because I think if you're not a joke thief and you're not somebody that essentially screws over other communities, because that's what it looks like. It looks like for the most part, they try and protect their own, right? That's why sometimes a lot of people, some comedians get really pissed off when, you know, other comedians pile on to the pylon, right? When there's like a cancel thing going on, Irish Shafi, whoever it may be, or Lucy K. Other comedians don't like it when other comedians start kicking them the way they're down because they know, they're acutely aware that it could, that kind of um, counselling could come back around and bite you in the ass, and then you, who who are you gonna be your friends at that point? So if you're someone like Carlos Sia, you have to come to a realization that even though you don't think you did anything wrong, people think you did something wrong. So you urge yourself to try and clarify, to try and rectify the situation by addressing it head on, calling the person that called you out, and seeing if you can kind of smooth it over. And if you can't, fair enough, you've tried, but at least try to do that. And he hasn't. Because I think he doesn't want to hear the answers. He doesn't want to be confronted with the truth. He's trying to bury his head in the sand. But again, I don't know why he'd want to do that for 15 years. I have nothing to apologize to him for. He's one person that I never bumped. I never went on before him when he was on schedule. Always on after him. I don't have any reason to call him. If I did, I would. It would which is weird. So he knows I'm not ready to call him because Joe Rogan, he didn't bump in directly. But what he did do to him was that he, he affected um, his friends, right? He kind of brought harm to Joe Rogan's friends. So if, you're, if your friend is, I would imagine, I don't know, everyone is different in their regard, but I'd imagine if somebody did wrong by your friend, you would try and back them up, right? In any way that you can. So it, it's not out of the realms that like if your friends didn't want to speak up with it, especially back then, right? Back then, maybe the entertainment world was a bit more of a gay institution. There were more gatekeepers. There were more hoops that you had to jump through. You had to kind of acquiesce to some people. You had to kind of play the, you know, the doting wannabe entertainer. Um, you had to take more shit. So maybe they didn't want to say anything because they want to ruin their chances of getting books on a show, booking a commercial, getting a feature, going on the road, uh, booking a commercial, whatever. They didn't want to hamper their chances of earning a living in the thing that they love so they just kept it quiet but somebody like rogan who was a bit you know who had maybe a few money at the time who was untethered who didn't have any um corporate sponsors telling him what he couldn't and couldn't do he felt that it was his duty to come in and sort of call it out and that's what he did just call it out on the behalf of his friends if you watch the original video that's what he basically does he doesn't say it happened to him he says it happened to all his friends seemed disingenuous it, from my opinion, because so, what, 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 what would I say? 
So I, I say you hired me, at, and it's called the David PR firm. Right. I'm your publicist. Right. And I'm your attorney. Yeah. So I'm a guy that got my JD. Tell me something better than the hundreds of thousands of dollars I've spent on guys telling me to do that. Now watch this. We're sitting out. Actually, yeah. and, and I'm doing a pro bono. I don't even want your money. Okay? <laughs> okay. We're friends. Okay. We went to, you got a four-year degree. We went to college together. Right. And we partied together. Right. And we always got along. Right. right. We went to clubs. We had a blast. We have great stories. We have right. bad stories on your end. Right. You've seen me hammer plastered. You have to right. pick me up and put me in the car. Okay. So we're talking. All That's right. who we are, right? Yeah. I say, do you know what, Carlos? You say what? I said, dude. How confident are you that you didn't do any of this stuff? Pat, I'm telling you, I'm 100% confident. Nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm 100% confident. Bro, if you're that confident, I think you should send out a tweet and say, if Joe is willing to have me on his show and we go live and he wants to bring any other friends that he wants to say that this happened, I'm willing to go on. I've done that. Through proxies. Not proxies. Public. Oh, I've done that with friends of his that I have befriended. But that's not how to do it, though. Mm. If you are that confident in what you're doing, because if you go on Twitter right now mm -hmm. and you say, Joe, it's been 15 years. Mm -hmm. I want to know why you were so mad at me. Right. I'm willing to come ask me any question you want. I, I have no problem doing that. Have you done that? No. I'd love to see you do because But like, I've done it, like I said... Through proxies, but 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 this is I've a big done it difference. Through, through friends of you know friends of his <clears> that <throat> I befriended and said, hey. which again this is this is kind of on the crux of it. And again, it continues on and on, on. He just doesn't you know he, he finally gets that towards the end. But I think from conclusion, it looks like he doesn't necessarily want to have that conversation because he's afraid of what may come up. Because I'm sure there's probably more to this story than what is kind of been said in public probably more stuff that will probably make him look worse so the best thing to do is to kind of play the innocent naive i don't know what's going on these guys are crazy i didn't do anything wrong sort of routine but again i would just would i would just it's just bizarre to me because i would assume being left out in a cold this long in a community that you were you know one of the mainstays of who you were you know he, he was very popular at the time well known he was one that had all the heat behind him suddenly go from there to suddenly now playing on cruises or in random places that no one gives a shit about to not having us because you know this is Carlos Mancia mate he's a you know he's a legend in the game not even quote unquote he's he's got a really good CV in terms of in comedy but he doesn't have a special on Netflix doesn't have one on Amazon on YouTube nothing He's just kind of doing his thing in India on his own. And that's because he's essentially been iced out by the industry. No one wants to touch him with a barge pole. So you'd assume in his position, he'd want to clarify the situation so he could get back in the good grace of everybody and just be safe. But he doesn't want to. So I'm assuming it's because he doesn't want to unearth the skeletons that happened pre previously. And to be honest as well, I just don't think Rogan would have him run anyway. I think he's... Um, I wouldn't say he's... Uh, he does Rogan surprises you sometimes because he did have Stephen Crowder on and that went really bad the first time and he had him on the second time again or he apologized I don't know but he, he does do things that you don't expect but I think things like this when they're so egregious when they're so blatant when the person doesn't make any sign of effort to rectify the situation he, there's no way that you can kind of speak sense to him but I'm interested to see what's going to happen now because he does have an interview booked in for the Tiger Belly podcast so that might be a good way to kind of uh, get back in the gears of people but I don't know I'm not too sure I don't think it's going to be a good thing for him to go on those shows and lay himself bare it's going to probably end up in more tears but who knows